Does it line up with scripture? Does it line up with original intent? Or does it line up with what the world has given? For far too long now, uh, we find black men and women in a cycle of conscious and unconscious rejection. Without love from him, she reacts without respect. Without respect from her, he reacts without love, and the madness continues. Therefore, along with discernment, loving a woman is required to call out the wife that's in. And I know this is a unique concept, so I'm taking a little time to continue up to unpack this. And again, all we have to do is look back at creation. Everything God did was out of love. All creation was called into existence and made available to mankind because God loved us. God himself is love. Amen. So when we want to, actually, when we want to call God out and into a circumstance or a, a situation that we face, then what do we do? We praise and we worship. That's God's love language. So when we do that, that's love calling unto love to reveal love. See, like Adam and the woman, uh, uh, we have levels of consciousness. And I believe, really, they had more than the three we're aware of. But access to those levels were limited to us and called, cut off at the fall. But we do still have those three levels. And one level is consciousness. That's where we receive input from the senses. We analyze facts and make decisions based on information. The next is the subconscious level. We have where every experience we ever had, every thought, every impression of loss and gain resides in the subconscious mind. And it determines the patterns of thought and behavior far more than we realize. And then there's the superconscious. This is where intuition and heightened mental clarity flow from superconscious awareness. The conscious mind is limited by its analytical nature and therefore sees all things as separate and distinct. Catch this now. And we, we get puzzled by certain situations because it seems unrelated to other events. But in superconsciousness, this level of operation, uh, it sees all things as a part of a whole. See, in other words, in the superconscious level, it, it doesn't just see a problem, it sees a problem and a solution. See, if I can kind of paint a picture of that, my, my wife and I got a daughter. She was born with congenital heart defects. And you know, what blew me away when we, when, when 
for a first surgery and doctors were explaining her condition, they explained why she did not die in my wife's womb. Because every complication she had offset the other. In other words, every complication provided an answer to the other problem. For, for, for example, you know, her, 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 well, my wife ain't explained, but her, her, one of her problems were both two arteries were going on one side of her heart. That should have caused, caused her heart to explode. Wow. But she also had a small hole in her heart on that same side that released the pressure. Wow. See, <laughs> that's, that's, that's how super consciousness flows. And it was amazing, man. My, my wife, she, I, I'm going to be honest, she amazed me. To talk to her about my daughter, you would, you would think she was a cardiac surgeon. I mean, she knew details, the, the, the words and everything. Uh, uh, AT&T had sent a jet down to fly us to uh, uh, Boston's Children's Hospital because Eggleston couldn't do the surgery. And I worked for AT&T at the time. So the news caught hold of me, and Monica called me, Kimberly Kennedy came and interviewed me. They interviewed my wife, they were, ah, look on the news, she on there about two minutes. My little interview was about 10 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> 10 seconds. Because all I could say was God. They was asking, why would at and send a jet down to you, God? Yeah. Who are you that they give it to God? Yeah. How are you gonna get up with God? <laughs> we don't want it, ma'am. <laughs> but they didn't get up. It, it amazed me, but now I come to realize because she was speaking from a place of that super consciousness. She understood it. That's after the service. She'll tell you. <laughs> Bless God. Uh, so like I said, when, when we look at this, we, and I want to go back to this garden situation with the serpent, because I believe it's still in this area of consciousness that the wife abides and functions from. Because what better source can a man ask for than to have a wife operating from this level of consciousness? Wow. What better place of incubation for our vision than a wife operating in this level of consciousness? Amen. So when the serpent attacked the, the plan of God, he targeted the woman who at that time was operating from a conscious level with the serpent and Adam. In fact, I'm not really sure if at this point Adam had fully called out his wife. And I took time to paint this picture of this difference between having a woman or a wife. Not just a wife by legal document, but by spiritual order and principles. See, in fact, the truth is actually, uh, uh, we declare this in many wedding vows today. Men, how many of you who are married said, I do to this question? Do you take this woman to be your lawfully wedded wife? Okay, now, like Adam, we were presented with a woman. The priest, the minister, the pastor, he stands in the stead of God, right? So he presents us with a woman. Then we agree to take this woman. We are acknowledging at that moment we were being presented with a woman, not a wife. Mm -hmm. Then what follows that is to be. To be is a linking verb used for giving information about someone or something. It is also used to make reference to that which is to come. Or, how about E, wife? Okay, okay. As such, this is more of a prophetic statement than a Bible. This is what is to come. I'm presenting the woman now. But do you got to call out the wife? <laughs> then it's followed by the wedding. Wedding refers to the reconnection of the woman to the man, but not as woman, but as his wife. Because according to God's order, wound man was taken out of man and then elevated from a function in man to a being separate from him to a company and assist him. Woman was no longer the sole nature of her existence, but now it is a function
function of her new existence as a wife. Yeah, y'all got to get got to chew on that. Yeah, we taping this, right? Yeah, y'all get the tape. <laughs> <laughs> and see, brothers, we are presented with a wife for us to reveal, release, unwrap, and find the wife within. Without understanding that some men are living with gifts that are partially unwrapped. It's like, it's like, brother, I'm going to use something that we love, television. It's like getting a 60-inch television, taking the wrapping off, and hanging it on the wall while it's still in the box. You may appreciate having the television, but you can't enjoy the function and purpose of it.
Now they kicking you out the club because you messing up people's drinks. The chains falling in the drink. Kick you out the club. Now you're completely humiliated. Why? Because of the power of a woman. Come on, let's keep it. You ain't going there for the wings and the dip. You going there because no women in there. If the woman wasn't there, you wouldn't be in there. But come on, let's keep it real. Let's act like they got kind of power on me. Yeah, right. The foundation of relationship is intimacy. The foundation of intimacy is trust, dependability, provision, and confidence. Trust is required in order for a person to expose themselves beyond surface level. Dependability is required to reveal one is worthy to be trusted. Provision is required to enjoy and participate in the attributes of intimacy. Confidence is required to provide the certainty that the attributes of intimacy will be provided. And from this beginning, from the beginning, excuse me, the enemy has been working to destroy the foundation and the relationship between us and God and us and each other. Now, any good strategist desiring to destroy something will target the foundation of it. So allow me to address this from a practical view as opposed to a scriptural religion. And in that, I want to make some references to our African-American slavery experience. And why do that? I know some people have issues with it. Why do they got to go back there? It's over with. It's done and over. I'm just going to echo my Angela. She says, history, despite its drenching pain, cannot be unlived. But if faced with courage, need not be lived again. I'm dropping the mic on that right there. So the African American slavery experience was a system process of stripping away our manhood, self-identification, awareness, and the trust of women and children upon the men. Psychologically and physically, we were rejected as men. It served to destroy the natural relationship between the man and the woman psychologically for generations to come. In 1712, a major slaveholder from the West Indies by the name of William Lynch was summoned to America to help Southern slaveholders uh, control their slaves and manage them better. So in Virginia, on the banks of the James River, he came and gave a speech entitled The Making of a Slave. And I, I actually brought the speech with me, but it's, uh, I'm not going to read from the speech because it's just too, too uh, graphic, painful. But I share the concepts of it. Because in that speech, he shared methods to be used to break the spirit and the will of the man and the woman. And the plan involved destroying the natural relationship and the strong dependency of women upon the man. And so to do this, what they would do is gather together the women, the children, and the strongest men of that camp. And if a woman happened to be pregnant, they would make sure they would place her in the front. They wanted her to make sure, they wanted her, excuse me, to make sure that she experienced fully what was about to take place so that could be engrafted into her unborn child. And what they would do is they would take the strongest man and put them in the center and they would beat him. They would castrate him. Sometimes they would set him on fire. Sometimes they tied their arms and legs to two horses and pulled them apart. All with the pur purpose of destroying the image of the strong man. And now with that in place, women and children now have found themselves in a frozen state of psychological independence. And in that, your confidence in us is meant to be able to protect you, provide for you, and cover you. It's dead. And so you no longer respect us. You can no longer count on us. And the man becomes dead because we feel it.
obvious situation, our women had to develop concepts of self-government and self-determination and self-reliance. And that's why when the, when the women's movement of the 60s birth, you know, independent, you know, and they was out there marching and stuff, sister, y'all was already there by force. This also caused mothers to raise their sons to be strong physically but passive and weak mentally so they wouldn't pose a threat and be killed. These effects are still impacting us today. Now we gather around television sets and computer screens and we watch strong young men being beaten and cast 